Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato! Here it, here it, here it, here it comes. This is the 19th take here in Marsh. Nathan Drudy back with you for another week. Drudy's one of our favorites has finally broken a drought, a 1,610 day drought to be exact on the PGA Tour. I speak, of course, of Ricky Fowler, who's been crowned the 2023 Rocket Mortgage Champion. Uh, we will get to that in a little bit more, but straight off the top, uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts. And this is a question without notice mm. intentionally. Uh, there's been a seismic event that could you know, shape diplomatic relations between Australia and England moving forward in the last 24 hours. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on on the run out uh, because I'm not sure uh, to invoke the famous line of commentary in our opener. In your life, have you ever seen a reaction of this nature out of uh, out of England and Fleet Street Press more uh, more specifically? Well, what I would say first and foremost is thank you for picking up the slack uh, for both of us with your your vocal nature on Twitter in the past twenty four hours, I've quite enjoyed your uh, <laughs> your efforts behind the keyboard. Uh, look, it's out. It's as simple as that. You know, it's a, it's a. I think there has been so much made of it. It's as simple as that. It's not like Alex Carey held the ball for any longer than he needed to. He threw the ball immediately, walked out of his crease, stay in your crease, you fucking idiot. It's pretty simple. Um, I, I think all the shit that the Poms have thrown at, at, at them, like they have very short memories. I mean, there's in, there's footage of Bairstow doing at the exact same thing in the first innings to Manus Labashain. They've done it in New Zealand. I mean, Stuart Broad has just cemented himself as one of the great fuckwits in my mind for his antics on the... I, I like, he... He's ability to grind my gears from so far away is, <laughs> is unparalleled um, uh. for a bloke who's passed it. I mean, yeah, they're two nil down and anyone would think that they are two nil up. Like it's, it's actually been unbelievable. Brendan McCullum to come out and say, Oh, we're not going to have a beer with them. I mean, come on, Brendan, I, I really like you, but gee whiz, you're slipping Ben Stokes to say, oh, we wouldn't have done that. I mean, please, fucking spare me. I don't know. You've got me riled up early, KM. So my apologies to to the listeners. You've got me riled up. Don't apologize at all. It was exactly my intention. Uh, as it turns out, I knew uh, if I just pulled on a little thread there at the beginning, we'd get you, and we certainly did. Uh, look, I think you probably uh, surmised my thoughts neatly. Um, I, 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 for one, don't have nearly as large a problem with Stuart Broad. I actually think uh, probably an unpopular opinion in Australia. I actually think he's quite a good character for the game. And and I thought, actually, to be fair, his first, when he, when he came out after that first over where he kind of did the check, am I okay, is it over? I actually thought that was quite funny. But to do it like more than once and to yeah. carry on the way he did was absolutely absurd, not to mention the fact that he's done it himself. Um, not to mention the fact that in 2013, he absolutely smashed the ball the first slip and didn't walk, and now he's invoking the spirit of cricket. Uh, that's not, it was Not, it not was, to mention, and probably most importantly, Marshy, the bloke bowls with a fucking headband on. So yeah. that's oh, taking mate. everything out. I mean, today, it was just, it's just been absolutely chef's kiss stuff today out of England, <laughs> and it's uh, it's brought me no end of joy sitting at my work desk uh, combing through Honestly, I, there was a point at which today, and, and I, I, we do digress, but it is driving the discourse mm. in Australia at present. Mm. So it would be rude um, as documented cricket fans not to address it from the top. I, honestly, I, I thought there was a point probably about mid-morning, which if you think about it, it's kind of like midnight UK time. So they've got through the game. They've had some hours to digest. And I really felt like that was the moment at which – it was gaining momentum. Like mm. people, they kind of got back home and they just decompressed and they was like, fuck it, I'm getting my thoughts out on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and thankfully, you know, Elon's new rate didn't cut me out because I was really enjoying all of the uh, all of the tweets. But honestly, there was a point mid-morning where I thought we, we'd rub sandpaper on the ball again. Yeah. Like, honestly, like the reaction was incredible yeah. for something that is legitimately within the laws. 
Uh, yeah, and, no, was, and not to mention like Starks thing the the night before where they're all well, playing yeah. the spirit of the game. Like, I actually think probably the right decision was made around Starks. Hundred percent, Starks. Hundred percent. By the letter of the law. Yeah, by the letter of the law. My issue is Johnny Bairstow. You're out. Yeah, well, that's right. This is this is my thing. So my issue with the Stark catch is not with the decision; it's with the law, and the law like patently needs to change because that's the catch any day of the week. But this is the point I was, I was making earlier today. Like, honestly, the reaction to what was a widely acknowledged catch mm. simply ruled out because under the letter of the law, it was not a catch. Reacts to the, you know, the fucking tired, same old Aussies always cheating chant. Mm. And then we get to today to something, again, under the letter of the law, completely fine. Yeah. Same old Aussies always cheating. Like, they, mate, it is poetry like they are falling apart at the seams at yeah. two nil down it's beautiful and one thing i know for certain the the very best thing about all of this and there's some pretty fucking ugly behavior not least of which in the long room mm. um from some of the mcc members but the very best part of this is the fact that we're back on again in three days yeah. because head headingly will be a fucking abattoir for us to walk out into uh, it will be chaos and i love it I do you know, absolutely love it. Do you know, I my favourite part about all of this is I actually don't don't feel like we're out of fourth gear. Like nothing's clicked for us really. Like the, apart from Smith's ton, like no one's really gone out and made big runs. Really put put anyone to the sword. Kwaja, you know, uh, is probably in that category. Is but no one's really gone out and dominated sure. with, with the bat. Sure. Our bowling plans, the starters have been. Abysmal. What we were dishing up last night to Ben Stokes was like I'm surprised he didn't make 400 yesterday. It yeah. was it was dreadful what what we bowled to him. Um, not the least of which, like he's very, very, very talented. I mean, Smith was dropping catches that he would normally eat for breakfast. So I don't think we've 100. We've got out of fourth gear, and they are. And, and let's not forget we lost our frontline spinner. Like the, you know, yeah. everyone's talking about yeah. You know, Oh yeah, but we lost Jack Leach. I mean, like I reckon cool. Jack Leach might struggle to get it, get a game for Les Maz first grade. To be honest, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not certain that he's getting a run down it. Got a Rayon. pretty good. We got a pretty good tweaker at Rayon. So yeah. don't worry about that. Well, we do. We absolutely yeah. do. Anyway, no, look, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Anyway, this is not the great cricketer, uh, <laughs> or or the final word for that matter. Two great cricketing podcasts. If you don't already listen, I certainly do. Highly recommend. This is in fact the nineteenth tea, and we should talk about uh, as I said off the top, one of our favourites, Big Dick Rick. Yeah, uh, gets it done. One thousand six hundred and ten days after his last victory back in twenty. 19. Uh, he secures his sixth all time victory on the PGA Tour. Uh, that in and of itself elevates him again uh, into elite company. Uh, and he does it on the first playoff hole at the Rocket Mortgage. Look, Drudes, I kind of been thinking about it today, and it was necessary that we cover it because he is, you know, he, he holds a place near and dear to, to both of our hearts and to this podcast more broadly. But I do kind of feel as though. We've been talking about the resurgence for some time. Mm. So I don't necessarily know that there's a lot to relitigate in terms of where his golf is at because mm. we've talked through the numbers. We did it extensively in the lead into the US Open, um, you know, where we thought he may figure it and did for 54 holes. I think what I want to talk about tonight uh, is how impressive I find it that his first up start after such a disappointing finish at a major, he goes and gets the job done, particularly the way in which he played today where – uh, he had the wobbles on, uh, and, and previously what we've seen is probably an inability to close on a Sunday. Not only did he have the wobbles on, but he had a, a super impressive final round, and I say that through gritted teeth of Colin Morikawa, mm. and I had 64 on Sunday to put himself in the conversation and really should have been nine under, given he lipped out on, on the 72nd hole, which ultimately would have secured the victory for him. In those circumstances before, we've probably seen Ricky Wilt a little, and I thought the manner in which he stepped up, uh, stuffed it to like four foot on the seventy second hole to get himself into a playoff with the birdie, and then ultimately drains the kind of ten to twelve footer to win uh, win the tournament on the first playoff hole. So I was super impressed. Um, it, it would have been well within his rights to probably dip a little off the back of the U.S. Open, uh, and he's come back out in his first start since and and won his you know first tournament in three hundred years. Well, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head and very easy for him to go to water host 
a big tournament like the US Open. And we, and we sat here after that and, and mentioned, you know, it was great. Maybe it was a, a little bit ahead of where he actually is and we needed to see the win come first. And, and now he's got that under the belt. And I think we probably, I, I alluded at the time I made the reference to Jordan Spieth and his resurgence. And I think there's still an element of that that's that's kind of true. Spieth broke through again and, and got the win and, and Ricky's now done that. And, and I think as well to, to win a, a decent sized tournament, not, not, uh, a, a, not knocking any other tournaments on their schedule, but you know, to win a good sized tournament to beat two very handy players in, in a playoff as well is significant. So I think, um, yeah, this is, this is going to hold him in very good stead. There's no doubt that he's been building towards it and, the mental resilience that he showed post us open disappointment when many were perhaps expecting him to go on with the job, uh, now to come out and win is, is really impressive. And the way that he was striking his irons was fantastic. I think that was, uh, um, that was demonstrated. He was first in strokes gained approach across, across the tournament. So the, the, there's really good signs. It wasn't just a, it's not a flash in the pan. It is sustained. There is, some element now that you, that you probably have a little more confidence in picking Ricky moving forward. And um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's good for golf, Ricky winning. We, we talk about it a little bit, you know, the, the saturated term of, I, I do think he is someone who, who moves the needle um, for golf in general anyway. Oh, certainly. And, and I think, what I see in terms of a difference is is a, a level of comfort mm. within his own game that we probably haven't seen in some time. He touched on a little bit on it today, uh, and I thought it was it was never more perfectly illustrated than his reaction after sinking the putt on the first playoff hole. You know, um, uh, not to say that there's any right or wrong way to celebrate a victory, but I suppose you juxtapose that to Keegan Bradley last week. Uh, or even Wyndham Clark after he uh, won the US Open, there's often overly um, emotional uh, and passion-based emotion in terms of fist pumps and visceral roars and things of that nature when you when you go to celebrate a victory. And, and to simply see him kind of cross his hands over on top of his putter and, and kind of throw his head back and almost exhale, mm. it, 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 it was a real tangible demonstration of what has been building up for that three and a half years in the journey he's been on. Mm. But I think, I think, uh, as I said, there's, there's a level of comfort when you watch him. He plays now with a, a genuine uh, rhythm, which I find really impressive. Like there's no delay. He's one of the fastest players on tour. You watch him like he, his, his playing partner will play, they cut straight to him. He's over the ball and he's ready to go. Mm. Right. And, and I think that comes with a level of confidence in your game because uh, there's one thing to have pre-shot routines, but there's another thing to hesitate and delay over the ball. If there's not a conviction in, 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 the way in which you're going about your golf mm. and, and the manner with which he plays and the rhythm with which he plays tells me that there is a complete faith in what he's put together. Now that's, that's the, the, the result of mountains of hard work and an awful lot of misses and failures, but it's got back to a place now where he, he turns up and you can see it. Like he's splitting fairways with a driver. He's absolutely stuffing approach on to your point. And, it's as good as we've seen in part probably since the, you know, kind of 2013, 2014, 2015 version of Ricky. Mm. Well, it's funny you talk about split and fairways. I mean, he did anything but on the, on the player. Yeah. Part, well, you know, and, and that's <laughs> save for his back nine this week, this week, but just super impressive though, from where he was to a get it on the green and B put it, put it close and, and make birdie because I mean, after the three T shots were done, I mean, I would have, for all money, you would have bet on Colin Morikawa from where where Hadwin and Morikawa were, and I think Morikawa went long and Hadwin went short, or, or one of the or vice versa, and it just yeah, it, it was a bizarre set of circumstances, and uh, for Ricky to step up and and really, I guess take the ascendancy back and then go on and sink a great putt, yeah, it is massive for him. So yeah, really really pumped to see Ricky back in the winner's circle. I think uh, for all intents and purposes now, he's he's almost 
guaranteed his place in the American Ryder Cup team um, come September at Marco Simeone Golf Course in in Rome. Uh, and I, I would strongly suggest he, uh, having played well there previously, uh, and the the manner in which he's playing and how that probably suits link style golf uh, more than most, I'd be very surprised if he isn't on or near the first kind of sheet of betting as it relates to the Open Championship in three weeks' time at Royal Liverpool in Hoy Lake. So yeah, he's man, he's trending in a in a remarkable direction. Um, at the moment, and 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 to your point, I think uh, we've said it ad nauseum on this podcast. It's it's the game uh, at a macro level is far better for it when he's like that, a, a supremely popular individual within his peer group, uh, more broadly within fans. And yeah, I think the uh, the level of perspective he seems to have, and I, I'm reticent to use mm. the word, I, I think is what's a, a big part of what he's coming back to. Yeah. And, and where he's at now. So congratulations to Ricky. Um, I, I might, only because I, I probably don't have a whole heap to add, I might just let you uh, give us, you know, a minute or two on Colin Morikawa because it's it's as good a golf as we've seen from him in a long mm-hmm. time. Uh, and it's it's what we ask often on this podcast is being able to do that. Like that wasn't an eight under 64 on Thursday. Mm-hmm. That was an eight under 64 with a tournament on the line mm-hmm. uh, and should have been. Um, should have been a 63 given how close that punt went on the 72nd hole. Uh, as I said, which ultimately would have made the playoff redundant. He would have won the tournament by one stroke. So it's as it's as good, as I said, as we've seen him for, for quite some time. Well, one of only two players to finish inside the major, major categories, uh, top 25 in the major stroke game categories, him and Peter Hoost. I don't even know who that is. Never heard of him. <laughs> finished T4. Congratulations, Peter. Uh, and again, strokes game putting, he finished 24th. And I think that's, the critical thing because he's so consistent with everything else, you know, strokes gained off the T six T to green second, like everything else is there. It's just the putter. So when that works, he's going to finish nearer to the top of, of the leaderboard. And, and to your point, he came out and he was behind by a long way and he flew home and, and got himself into a playoff. And, and like I said, after the three drives, you would have had all, all money on, on Colin Murakow from that point. Um, but, couldn't get the job done, and maybe that's just where he <clears throat> where he is right now um, in his game. But there's no doubt. I I still think you can't write him off in tournaments. He he's too good. Um, and as I say, it's just that one final lever that he needs to pull, and that's the putter. And if it works, he's going to be at the top of more leaderboards than he's going to be missing cuts. So, yeah, a good week for Colin. I think to to maybe build a bit more confidence back in the game. And um, yeah, I mean he. <laughs> He's won an open championship. I'm not saying I'm going to pick him, but he's won an open championship before, so he, he can play that style of golf too. So, yeah, good good for Colin. Uh, don't feel as though we need to spend a whole lot more time no. on the Rocket Mortgage unless well, you Cam, need, uh, Cam, Cam, Cam Davis. Davis. Aussie, yeah. Yeah, the highest finishing Aussie at T17. For the three Aussies, Harrison Endicott, Aaron Badley, and Cam Percy. Uh, all unfortunately didn't play the weekend. Mm. Pretty stiff. Four under doesn't get to the weekend. I mean, 24 under wins the tournament. That tells the story. But four under doesn't get you to play Saturday, Sunday, which is tough. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, um, Justin Thomas. We've had a watch on Justin Thomas for a little while now, uh, not least of which since he's 81 at the US Open. Uh, he, he bounced back last week. It was last week because we mentioned hit a 62, I believe, Yep. Uh, at the tournament. Uh, last week, well, he missed a cut uh, at the Rocket Mortgage, which I believe makes it uh, an MC in three of his last four outings. Mm. So, yeah, there's something for as much of a lock as um, we say Ricky Fowler is for the American team. And, and let me be crystal clear. I do not envisage a world in which Justin Thomas is not on the American team. But good God almighty. Uh, like. <laughs> He, he's in the wilderness at present and he well, will need to find something or else he won't be playing many other sessions other than the singles. I can't imagine. To be honest, like you couldn't be him with a great deal of confidence right now, the way he's playing. I know no. match play is very different, but yeah. and I don't want to clutch at straws like I did and make another stupid comparison, but there were back, I think it was a 2019 President's Cup here, and you were very much on the horse about picking Jordan Spieth when he was completely in the wilderness because of his match play. I'm not saying that's the level that JT's at, but there sure. is no way. You've got to pick form players, um, and I think form 
form is very important. But yeah, we shall see what they uh, what they do with JT. But he's got a lift. Anyway, it's a sl- it's a slippery slope to be honest. Uh, it is. Like he's not there now, surely. But uh, you know, it's mm. not it's not inconceivable the way he's playing. Look, I think uh, the nature of the beast is that he and Jordan Spieth uh, seemingly run that team from a player's perspective. So. As I said, I can't imagine a world in which he's not picked and he probably gets maybe the first day of the morning or the afternoon session he gets to play with Jordan to see where he's at. And then, you know, if it doesn't happen, it's it's hard to hide a guy, you know, because we're talking about, as it relates to the Ryder Cup, the conversation at the moment is the, 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 the competition is going to be won from players 8 to 12, yeah. right? And that's where... I suppose if you have a concern about the European team, it's the depth from eight to twelve. Well, shit, you know, I'd probably take a number of players eight through fourteen or fifteen on the European side at present over Justin Thomas. So it's hard to hide, really hard to hide in a team of twelve at a Ryder Cup. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of, yeah, I was going to say, speaking of Europe, uh, the Kiwi Daniel Hillier is a first-time winner. On the DP World Tour in his rookie season, uh, he did it with two birdies and an eagle in his final four holes. Uh, and, and it's not an insignificant tournament, not to suggest that there are any insignificant tournament or insignificant maiden victories, but the British Masters at the Belfry Roots. So he not only sews up his first ever victory on the European Tour, he also qualifies himself for the 151st Open Championship. In a couple of weeks' time. So a phenomenal weekend uh, for the Kiwi, Daniel Hillier. Yeah, Sunday 66. I mean, that'll do it most days. Um, I know the, the runner-up did as well. But, uh, yeah, 547000 in the in the pocket as well. And, yeah, it really jumps up a lot in terms of race to Dubai and opens a lot of doors, as you mentioned. And, and just wonderful scenes as well. I mean, there was a lot of content out on social media today. I'm sure people would... If they're listening to this, they're probably following Dave Michaluzzi and and he was there and just wonderful celebrations with with Mika and Minwoo Lee and uh, and Daniel Hillary uh, Daniel Hillier there. So make sure you go and uh, check all those out. So that was really really pleasing to see and um yeah I mean it's sixty nine sixty six on the weekend is is very very fine golf and that's going to win you most tournaments. So uh, yeah, when the tournament was on the line had the uh, canasters to step up and hit the shots that to to put himself in in the in the gun and in the lead position he wasn't going to die wondering because often those shots don't come off and you end up slipping down the leaderboard but uh yeah he's holding the trophy at the end of the day and look he's he's a player whose name's popped up I'd say a reasonable amount certainly not uh, to the level of some of our uh constant winners down here on the Australasian tour, but he's certainly been there and thereabouts for the last two or three summers uh, down here, both in the events in in his home country, New Zealand, and also in the Australian swing as well. So not necessarily unsurprising his trajectory, uh, but as I said, this is not a, uh, a not <laughs> trying to find a diplomatic way to say this is not a tournament in the arse end of Eastern Europe, Yeah, you know, at the halfway yeah, or, or the or, or the bottom of the bell curve as it relates to the DP World Tour season. Sure. This is the British Masters. It's the first tournament of the UK swing on the lead into the Open Championship. Uh, it's a it's a great paycheck, but it's a better platform from which to launch. And as I said, like two birdies and an eagle in his final four holes, uh, you know, staring down the barrel of being a few shots off uh, Gunnar Weeb or Gunnar Weeb. Uh, who held the clubhouse lead, who I just want to touch on in a moment's time. But, yeah, uh, phenomenal effort from Daniel Hillier and great to see him so well supported by, you know, a lot of guys who he's played a lot of golf with in this part of the world. And he's been building a little bit too. I mean, we talk about Ricky building and, and Daniel Hillier. I mean, having a look at his last five performances here, T3 at the BMW International um, and and a T5 at the KLM Open in his last five performances. Did, did put in a couple of poor ones in there. But... Uh, that's three top fives in his past five uh, tournaments, including a win. So things trending in the right direction for Daniel. So I mentioned uh, Gunnar or Gunnar Weeb, uh, the gentleman who finished uh, in second place, the American. Mm-hmm. Uh, he held the clubhouse lead there for a period of time um, prior to Daniel Hillier running over the top of him at the end of his round. How's this for a stat? Uh, Gunnar Weeb had only... 
made one cut from 14 starts in 2023 mm. and held a highest world ranking of 1,074th in the world. Gee. He held the clubhouse lead, as I said, until such time as Daniel Hilly went on that ridiculous uh, four under through four holes run on the way home. He qualifies for the Open Championship, does Gunnar Weep, as a result of that finish. Uh, obviously, his first ever major. So one cut from 14 starts in 2023. Uh, a world high ranking of 1,074th, mm. and, he'll, and he'll find himself in the field at uh, Royal Liverpool in three weeks' time. So. Not too bad. Not not bad. Uh, fuck, I love golf. It's just so good. Like, uh, and you look down. There's there's people. I mean, Justin Rose was in a tie mm-hmm. for fourth. Uh, mm-hmm. There's there's not you know not mugs playing this for a man Langask as it relates to. The, the European Tour, uh, Min Wee Lee himself is in a tie for 15th. Thilburn Olsen, Adrian Morant, the man who won the Australian Open last mm. year. Mm. Uh, Gunnar Weeb is off to Royal Liverpool for the 151st Open Championship. So good on you, Gunnar. Well done. Yossi's not much to report, really. Min Wee Lee, T15. I mean, another serviceable performance from from him and then three missed cuts. Jason Scrivener, Dave Michaluzzi and Blake Windred all missing the cut, unfortunately. Anything to add on those, KM? I just think a good little black booker uh, for Minwoo. I, th- I think he'll have, from memory, maybe one more appearance. I think he plays the Scottish yeah. Open. I don't think he's playing the Irish. So I think he plays the Scottish, and that will be his final hit out before the Open Championship. I anticipate him to play. I mean, <laughs> Newsflash, this is not me <laughs> throwing a big Hail Mary here. The guy's coming off a top 10 in a major at the US Open at the North Course LA Country Club, but I, I expect him to play well in the Open yeah. Championship. So yeah. really keen on tracking his progress across the next couple of weeks. It's his first tournament. He flew into the UK, uh, probably blow the cobwebs out, um, you know, re-acclimatise himself with Lynx Golf, go again in the Scottish Open, and then, you know, peak for the important stuff at, at uh, Hoy Lake. So yes. just one to keep an eye on moving forward. Uh, Drude's a little bit of news on the home front. So we had some confirmation, um, some moving parts in the last week. The schedule continues to flesh out for the upcoming season, uh, not least of which with the confirmation of your favourite trophy mm. on the Australasian summer returning and also confirmation of the worst kept secret in Australian golf, and that is that Kingston Heath will play host to the 2028 President's Cup coming back down under. So where do you want to start uh, on those pieces? Shall we flesh out the schedule and 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 stick with uh, Kingston Heath to round us out? Yes, I think so. Well, just before we do that, maybe shout out Anthony Quayle as well. Finished second, of course. In, second in in Japan. Not a not a huge um, uh, you know, war and peace on on Quayle there, but finished T two, won uh twelve point six million yen. Marshy, how many? How much do you reckon that is? I know the answer. Come on, hit me. How much do you reckon 12.6 million yen equates to in Aussie dollars? Like 400,000? 130. 130,000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There you go. Uh, So good on you, Quayley. Um, yeah, let's. So the schedule. I mean, the schedule's starting to, to pack out a little bit now. Obviously, the NT PGA Championship will come back seventeenth to the twentieth of of August. It's kind of moved around on the um, on the schedule a little bit. So that's great news that that is that is coming back. Uh, hasn't been competed since twenty twenty one, obviously, as we we mentioned, and um, back at Palmerston, which is exciting, and it's undergone a big amount of works as well i believe so that'll be uh great to have golf back up in the uh back up in the nt so i guess this is its traditional time slot um, in august so great to see that it's it's coming back the trophy's wonderful and uh yeah looking forward to having golf back up in the uh up in the nt there yeah certainly uh as as we well know it's it's a challenging environment and i think uh, it, it, it rewards probably those who can adapt to the conditions um, just as much as it rewards good golf. But it's yeah, comfortably one of our favourite tournaments on the on the rider uh, mm. because I think it exposes golf to a region that's 
you know, criminally undersupplied and yep. and underappreciated. We've spoken to a number of players who've gone through that Northern Territory path and ultimately, and it's not overly surprising, they do have to move to major centres in the East Coast to get a, a start properly. But, uh, yeah, look, I think it's it's really important that the game goes back to that region, I think, on an annual basis. So it's yep. good to see. Um, you know, the confirmation of that really important tournament moving forward. The Heritage Classic also um, joining back in the, the the tournament rotation as well. That's at St. John um, course, Jack Nicholas designed as well. So in the Yarra Valley there, that's um, going to be played in early January, the 11th to the 14th. So that's another great one. I think, you know, again, we um, shout out to the tour for what they've done. They're starting to pack out a really good uh, really good schedule of events um, at some at some great golf courses, and I think it's going to be again. It's going to be another really important summer um, for the tour, uh, and they are starting to build out a really really interesting schedule of uh, of events. So we'll keep you up to date with uh, everything as it starts to drop. Um, we'll, I suspect in the next couple of weeks we will get a full schedule locked and loaded i mean we already know a couple of things the wa open um that's not on the website at the minute i don't think it's been fully announced yet but that'll be it oh. at uh joondalup resort this year so that'll be a that'll be a fascinating one that's a that'll be great uh great viewing up there not a great physical viewing course to go and watch but it'll be great <laughs> great viewing in terms of watching uh watching from afar so yeah if you're heading if you're coming. heading along it's you're probably taking a Bit like the approach to Augusta National, you take the camp share and so. you park yourself in one spot, and and yeah, it's a brutal walk. So <laughs> yeah, there's some great <laughs> great spots that you'd be able to park up between three and four on the uh, on the June nine, I think would be. Is it there June? are quarry, yeah, no, in the quarry nine, three and four on the quarry nine or the June nine. Can't remember. I always get those two confused. But... We've got anyway. a bit of time. You can do a scouting mission for us. I will, uh, and then we'll round it out with Kingston Heath. So. Ooh. Confirmation, as I said, this has been in the works for some time. We knew it was coming back to Australia in 2028. I think you would have been naive to think it wasn't going back to the sand belt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then it was a matter of where uh, uh, they were reticent, I think, to go back to back at Royal Melbourne. You could probably mount an argument that you should just do that because it is the best course in the country, maybe the Southern Hemisphere. Uh so they looked at that option, but then if you look outside of that, there's probably not a lot that can host a mm. tournament, the scale of the President's Cup. That's nothing to do with the courses. It's more to do with the necessary infrastructure that needs to be bumped in uh, for an event like the President's Cup. So you, it narrows the field. You're probably looking at Kingston Heath, who've ultimately been successful. Peninsula Kings would be another one that you would think has the – the necessary scale and size to accommodate maybe metropolitan, but it's a small list. And ultimately they've gone with, um, you know, probably the second best golf course in the region. And that mm -hmm. might upset a few people listening who are particularly potentially Kings with members. It's, it's close, but Kingston Heath's a phenomenal course and they'll do a great job at hosting the event. Probably just your perspective. I mean, uh, only 50% of this podcast was present um, in Melbourne on the same belt. What, yeah. what, you know, what, what do you reckon it means for, us more broadly as a golfing, I suppose, nation that 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 comes back to Melbourne because it was a phenomenally successful event in 2019. It was, yeah, and it, and it drew a huge crowd. And and um, I guess between now and 2028, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge. I think in terms of golf coming to Australia. So if we are continually starved of what uh, of international golf, uh, which we don't expect to be, maybe in terms of uh, what this grand new world order is going to bring us maybe we might get a little bit more uh but it, it was exceptionally well supported at royal melbourne in in 2019 um and it will be interesting there was some commentary on our social media around um how they will go about bumping in such an enormous crowd on kingston heath given that it's not the same sort of property size as, as royal melbourne so that'll be that'll be an interesting one but i'm sure they've done their due diligence if they have um you know, if they've done, uh, if they've won the tender essentially. So yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to it. I think we, when we host the, the, the president's cup 
Um, I think it has to go to Royal, uh, into the sand belt, whether that's Royal Melbourne, whether that's Kingston Heath, whether that's down on the peninsula Kingswood, whether that's Metro, whatever it is, whatever those courses are, Commonwealth, you know, it, it's got to go to one of those. I, th- I think it would be um, somewhat of an injustice if it went anywhere else in Australia. So, yeah, I, I'm very much buoyed and, and excited. Of course, we host in 2040 as well um, down in Melbourne. So it will be uh, interesting to see where that one goes. I'd suggest it'll probably go back to Royal Melbourne. But, uh, yeah, great uh, great news for, I guess, golf in Australia and um, – and of course, the members of Kingston Heath as well. It's uh, a feather in the cap of of that very proud club. Well said. Nothing further to add. It will shape as a phenomenal week of golf as it was back in 2019. And mm. you know, you project forward. I think the only other thing I would add, 2028. You know, it's five years from now. It's uh, exciting to think how many Australian players will be on that international team. Yeah. Uh, yep. You know, the way that we're currently playing. You know, you, you think last time what we had, what do we have? I mean, well, <laughs> last time we didn't have the full complement uh, most recently in Canada, given the uh, live goal fracture that affected that team. But back in Melbourne, you know, we had Smith, Leishman, Scott. Uh, did Cam Davis play Melbourne? Oh, I can't or did he remember. just play? In, I think he definitely played in Canada. I don't know if he played in Melbourne. But, you know, you, you look at those emerging now, Mimu Lee, Lucas Herbert, um, our mate Mika, you know, going all guns blazing. Who knows where he projects to be in five years? You know, but yeah, the status right. on the European tour. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, exciting, very, very exciting times. And look forward to helping that back. Um, speaking of winning tenders, just briefly, uh, I didn't flag this on the agenda that lives in the cloud. It's obviously not in front of us. Um, I uh, not OCM. Sorry, Clayton Devries and Pont mm. have won the tender yes. to take a little look in your backyard, the Wembley Golf Club. Yeah, uh, the the busiest uh, by volume public golf course in the country, Clayton DeVries and Pont. Uh, now, is it maybe you've got more context than I do? Are we talking renovation? What's not a restoration because what's it being restored from? Mm. What, what's the, what's the scope of the works that we're looking at? Well, uh, first and foremost, I do. Uh, people will hear an episode in a couple of weeks. Uh, with Matthew Heath slash Ron Chopper. And as I was fumbling through my notes, um, I mistakenly said uh, Mike Cocking instead of Mike Clayton. Uh, so just getting out in front of my mistake there. Um, so I believe it's it's a fair amount of work that they're going to do. I've seen online that they are looking at converting it to a 18-hole golf course down from 36 and uh, putting Fascinating. in a... Sh- putting in a short course, a par three course, which I think will be exceptional. And I think that's, um, I mean, it'll be really interesting to see what that does to the numbers because it is slammed from open to close. It is slammed out there. Yeah. Um, but it will, uh, short courses, I think, are the way of the future for a lot of these clubs that do have an additional bit of land. There's, um, I mean, I think now through the entire 36 holes, I reckon I could probably pick out about 18 decent holes. The rest of them are pretty <laughs> straight up and down, to be honest. So just I think about to say, with the greatest it. respect to Wembley, there's not 36 correct. good holes out there. So, no, you know, Interesting, so, though, to drop it, to cut it in half as opposed to drop back to 27. Well, give I think yourself 20, the alternate nine. I think 27, there's one, there's a course here that I grew up playing, Hillview, and, uh, you know, I don't want to publicly shit on them, but, the, the way that that's You're managed, yeah, the way that the changeover is <laughs> managed because you've got players coming from this, the first nine to the second nine, there, there's that changeover happening when there's 18 holes, there's players that are coming from the third nine to the first nine, the changeover is just managed really poorly. So 27 holes poses a, a tough ask for a lot of clubs unless it's managed properly. So I think, yeah, I, I'm not sure how it will be met entirely um, if they do drop it back to 18. I did see on, on um, um, the the Instagram post that they were looking at an 18-hole course with a short course. Whether that gets across the line, I'm not entirely sure. So, um, yeah, we shall wait and see. But exciting news, I think. Um, yeah, there's yeah there's a little bit of activity happening around the place at Wembley. So I haven't been out there for a while. I must, must get out there. 